Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks to our panelists and the virtual audience of IFT 2020. Welcome to our session focusing on the interpretation of gut microbiome research and the safety evaluation of foods and ingredients. My name is Katera Rahmani of ConAgra Brands, and I'm delighted to serve as the moderator for today's event. Next slide. This session was organized by ILC North America and is a collaboration across three of the organization's committees of focus. For those who are not familiar with ILC North America, this is a nonprofit science foundation that provides a forum to advance understanding of scientific issues related to nutritional quality and safety of the food supply. ILC North America does not lobby or advocate for science or specific, excuse me, LC North America does not lobby or advocate for specific policies, but rather focuses on addressing scientific questions of relevance to the health of the public. This work is done through a tripartite model in which scientists from government, industry, and academia from the US and Canada are brought together to advance science for confident decision-making by all sectors. So LC North America has 11 committees focused on nutrition and food safety, and three of these committees jointly conceptualized and planned today's session. These committees are the Gut Microbiome Committee, the Food and Chemical Safety Committee, and the Low Calorie Sweetener Committee. You can see on the slide here the overall mission of each of these groups. Personally, I've been a member of the Food and Chemical Safety Committee for three years. Next slide, please. So just a quick thank you to everyone that helped with the session, and to our panelists, and as well as IFT. To communicate about the talk today, feel free to use the Twitter handle shown on the slide and visit the LC North America website to learn more. Looking at our outline for the session today, we have two excellent speakers. Our first speaker, speaker is Dr. Michael Parisa. Dr. Parisa, an Emeritus Professor of Food Science and Emeritus Director of the Food Research Institute at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He has authored or co-authored over 180 articles and publications, holds more than 25 U.S. patents, and before retirement was recognized by Tom Scientific as one of the most highly cited researchers of the past two decades. Dr. Parisa has re received numerous academic honors and awards, too numerous to mention, uh, in this brief intro. He's also inter internationally recognized as an expert in evaluating the safety of food enzymes and has developed the principal guidelines for evaluating the safety of microbially de derived food enzymes and microbial cultures that are used by government regulators and food enzyme manufacturers throughout the world. Okay, with that, I'd like to turn the podium over to Dr. Parisa. Thank you very much. Um, so let me begin by uh, sharing with you an outline of what I'm going to talk about over the next few minutes, the effects of the gut microbiome on food ingredients, then the effects of food ingredients on the gut microbiome, safety evaluation for uh, grass substances, generally regarded as safe substances, and then finally, some thoughts on evalu evaluating the safety of entirely new microbial species that are uh, undoubtedly going to be arriving, arising from the gut microbiome uh, research going on around the world uh, for use in humans in particular, but one can also imagine for use in animal uh, feed as well. <clears throat> so first for the gut microbiome, the effect of the gut microbiome on food ingredients, the best example I can think of here, which is based on well-documented research is lactose intolerance, which affects a very large percentage of the world's population. As, uh, as we age, uh, many people lose the ability to, uh, to lose the digestive enzyme lactase, which hydrolyzes lactose, uh, which is a disaccharide. It hydrolyzes, uh, lactose itself cannot be absorbed, um, but it, uh, the, the, the enzyme lactase hydrolyzes lactose into glucose and galactose, which then are absorbed. Uh, and everything's fine as long as you've got lactase. But if you don't have lactase, then the lactose, which isn't absorbed, ends up going down through the small intestine and into the large intestine where the gut microbes, they can always handle it and they love it. 
and uh, every one of them, I guess, can probably metabolize it, and you get uh, quite an experience uh, being a being somebody who suffers from this condition. I can tell you, it isn't pleasant. Uh, it takes a while. The symptoms ultimately subside after the lactose has been metabolized. So there's no long-term effects, but there are some short-term uh, discomfort from it. Another example, uh, this time of the food ingredients, which affect the gut, gut microbiome, uh, is probably best, uh, uh, the best example would be clostridial necrotizing enteritis. This is caused by the loss of proteases. And it can happen either to um, consuming foods that contain trypsin inhibitor inhibitors or uh, being on a starvation diet where you simply stop making the proteases that you need. And uh, if you then eat a big meal, what will happen is the protein doesn't get digested. It ends up going down into the lower GI tract, and it causes all kinds of trouble down there. Now you actually get organisms like Clostridium perfringens which are typically kept in check uh, by the other bacteria that are in your gut, uh, they now just spread out and grow like mad. And you get, uh, they produce uh, a toxin which causes this terrible enteritis, and this can actually kill you. The symptoms in this case don't subside until a balance in normal gut is restored, and that may take uh, quite a while. So it, uh, or intervention by bringing in probiotics. So this is a condition that's pretty serious, uh, and this is an effect of the food ingredient on the gut microbiome itself, causing an imbalance. Uh, there's also a lot of research on dietary fiber, and dietary fiber is sort of in the middle of the two because dietary fiber, on the one hand, um, is acted upon by the, by the gut microbiome, it digests it, but then some of the metabolites uh, of the fiber itself, the butyric acid and so on, then become nutrients that some of the bacteria can use. And uh, in this case, it's, it's quite beneficial. Uh, you can get pronounced shifts in bacterial diversity uh, in the production of uh, microbial derived uh, fecal fermentation end products uh, have been demonstrated. I'm reading now from this in as little as 24 hours when humans switch from an agrarian diet, which is rich in fiber, to a meat-based diet that was essentially devoid of fiber. This is a good review of this particular topic. And um, so you can get a, a switch pretty darn fast, uh, which is what you might expect with, my, with bacteria because they respond quickly to environmental changes. Uh, a big issue uh, has been, and a lot of research has been done, a lot of, a lot of uh, publications have appeared within the last few years on the, uh, on the potential of, of artificial sweeteners to uh, affect, uh, produce physiological effects uh, in, in, the, in the host, in the human or the animal, by altering the microbiome. So this has been an important uh, question. Here's uh, something from a recent review uh, of the subject. And in this particular case, the authors uh, have concluded that the consumption of sacro, uh, saccharin, sucro, uh, saccharin, sucralose, and aspartame cause alterations in the gut microbiota uh, in rodent models, leading to greater food intake, excessive weight gain, and alterations in blood glucose. So these three substances are supposed to be all able to affect these uh, same general symptoms by causing alterations in the gut microbiota. Now that <laughs> struck me as a little unusual. Um, if you look at the structures, saccharin, aspartame, sucralose, and here's uh, stevia glucoside, uh, you've got an interesting situation here. These three, uh, saccharin and sucralose and the stevia glucoside are not metabolizable by the digestive enzymes. And, uh, and the stevia glucoside gets metabolized a little bit by the microbial uh, flora. I don't know if saccharin or sucralose are metabolized at all by the microbial flora. I don't think they are. Aspartame, on the other hand, is metabolized uh, in the upper GI tract. So it's kind of hard for me to imagine why aspartame, which is absorbed, uh, should be fully absorbed uh, in the upper GI tract, should somehow have an effect on the colon. But that was the claim of, of at least some of the papers. 
And so the question I would immediately ask here is by what possible biochemical mechanism could structurally dissimilar non-caloric artificial sweeteners all induce the same adverse physiological effects via actions on microorganisms in the colon, especially given that one of them, aspartame, does not even reach the colon. Um, I think this is a, an issue that needs to be addressed by anybody who seriously is, is uh, promoting this, uh, this, this kind of research or conducting it. Secondly, if such a global generalized biochemical, biochemical react, a mechanism were to exist, should it also be triggered by other dietary xenobiotics, particularly ones that uh, we, we sense? And by that, I mean chemicals like this. Here's estragol, which is a common uh, spice found in a lot of different, if you, if you like Italian food, you'll, you'll eat a lot of estragol because it's commonly found in, in uh, seasonings that are used in Italian food. Limonene is another one uh, found in citrus fruits and pepper. So your, your fruit salad will have uh, limonene in it. And uh, here's one that I really like, zingiberine. Sounds like a title for a song, zingiberine, uh, main ingredient in ginger, <coughs> which, is, which is another flavoring ingredient. This is, these are just examples. There's thousands of these, literally thousands. So if you're really serious about uh, compounds affecting the microbiome, uh, that are structurally diverse, I think you need to keep in mind that we're consuming these things all the time and we vary them day to day. And we don't really know what effects these have uh, on the microbiome, if any. Um, but I think it's, it's interesting to bring it into the context of uh, considerations of the uh, non-caloric sweeteners, which supposedly aren't metabolized either, or which aren't metabolized, but supposedly have effects on the, on the uh, microbiome. Now, another uh, uh, group has, has analyzed all of this, uh, uh, the, these, these uh, papers on the effects of the low and no calorie sweeteners, and have concluded that uh, there are a lot of methodological uh, issues with this research, uh, both in the way the research was conducted and the way in which the research was uh, interpreted. And they've concluded that the sum of the data provides clear evidence that changes in the diet unrelated to artificial sweetener consumption are likely the major determinants of change in the gut microbiota numbers and phyla, confirming the viewpoint supported by all major international food safety and health regulatory authorities that artificial sweeteners are safe at currently approved levels. So a more plausible interpretation, I think, of the research uh, that has been published on artificial sweeteners is that either they're artifactual and there's, a, there's methodological issues as, as uh, proposed by uh, Lobach et al. Or if the research is uh, valid, then it's most likely specific to the chemical studied and really has nothing to do with that chemical's classification as a non-caloric artificial sweetener. I think that's a reasonable interpretation of what, of what we're saying here. Uh, so then comes up the question of safety evaluation for grass substances. And one of the questions that uh, has been asked is, should consideration for effects on the gut microbiome be incorporated uh, into food ingredient safety evaluation protocols? I don't think that's the right question. I think that's the wrong question. I think the right question is, how should consideration for the effects of gut microbiome incorporated in the food ingredient safety evaluation protocols? I think that's the right question. The uh, FDA has uh, said this in their red book, uh, pose these questions for the evaluation of uh, new food ingredients. Does the product alter the composition or nature of the gut flora? If it does, what are the toxicological consequences of the changes? So it's a two-part question, and I think it's a very reasonable one. Uh, in my opinion, for grass evaluations where safety evaluation is based on peer-reviewed research and scientific procedures, I think the standard 90-day rodent feeding study coupled with fecal analysis should suffice to answer these questions. Uh, changes in microbial flora without accompanying pathological indication should not necessarily or, or immediately trigger concerns, but you might need to uh, further explain them particularly if there's very if they're if they're 
effects that are large and they're not seen with uh, controlled diets. The nice thing about this kind of research or this kind of incorporating this kind of thing into standard uh, protocols is that you don't have to, it's, it's a bit like drawing blood. You can collect the feces from the same animal before the study starts, during the study and afterwards. So you can have a, you, you, can, you can watch what's going on throughout the entire 90 day feeding study um, and, and determine what effects are occurring. And uh, if so, uh, are they having any pathological uh, uh, effects, um, consequences? And then at the end of the day, if there's no change, if, if we're not, if you're not seeing it as any change in the pathology, then you need, you should ask the question, well, well, why did it happen and what does it mean? And it may not mean anything or it may mean something, but that's why we need to be doing this, this kind of research. And um, as more, uh, as more research comes out on the entire microbiome uh, area, I think it'll be easier to interpret this kind of, these kinds of uh, studies. Now, what about evaluating the safety of entirely new microbial species? Uh, I've uh, we're, I published a paper with a number of colleagues uh, in 2015 on determining the safety of cultures uh, that are uh, that are that are typically or can be used either in, in, in some way, either as starter cultures or as probiotics and that sort of thing. But what's going to happen and in, in, in with the microbiome research is that of, uh, inevitably that we're going to identify entirely new species that will be considered as potential candidates for probiotic use. And the question is, how do you evaluate the safety of these newly discovered species? Even if they're coming out of so of presumably healthy individuals, how do you evaluate their safety or incorporation uh, into diets or, or probiotics, which can be given to uh, other people that may not have this, these particular organisms um, in their GI tract. So there's uh, a number of ways traditionally that things have been looked at. For example, the rodent feeding studies. Uh, in this case, the design of a study like this is virtually unlimited. You can do just about anything that um, would be ethical with, with a rat. Uh, the costs are moderate. But the application is very limited because there are really big differences in the gut environment between rodents and humans. Uh, rodents have very small GI tracts. They are very aerobic, so there's a lot of organisms that predominate in the GI tract of a rodent that simply don't, uh, that are very minor parts of, of a human uh, genome, or, or a human, not a human, <laughs> a human uh, 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 GI tract. Uh, and consequently, a lot of the strict anaerobes that we have, you can't even you can't colonize uh, a rodent with them. Uh, it would be impossible. They won't grow. They won't survive. Uh, so those are limitations you have. <clears throat> human clinical trials are obviously directly applicable to humans, but in this case, they're very expensive, and you obviously are very limited in what you can do with a human clinical trial. Uh, so I would suggest that one thing that uh, ought to be considered are pig models. These are applicable to humans because the gut environment of a pig is very similar to the gut environment of a human. The study design would be largely unlimited. The costs would be intermediate, uh, but there is limited availability of pigs for test protocols. Uh, as far as I know, there's no uh, testing facility in the country that's normally used by industry that would have a big colony of pigs that you could use. But there are, <coughs> Uh, colonies of pigs that are under research uh, that are being used for all sorts of research projects at land grant universities. And so, one thing I would suggest in conclusion is that industry should consider developing safety evaluation protocols for newly discovered probiotic candidate microbial species that use pigs and for other things as well. Uh, but, but this would be one, one uh, particular area that I think really stands out the probiotic candidates. Other grass substances may be useful in such a in such a model too. Once you got it going, and I think that this needs to include or should include partnerships with land land grant universities that have established animal sciences programs and veterinary medicine programs. So at that point, I will uh, conclude. Thank you, Dr. Parisa.
we'll wait for questions in, um, for the end. So next I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Roderick. Uh, so Dr. Roderick is a founding principal member of Ramble, a technical consulting firm, and is a visiting professor at the John Hopkins University of Bloomberg School of Public Health for almost 20 years. Dr. Rogers is an internationally recognized expert in toxicology, risk analysis, and regulation in 18 countries. He has consulted for hundreds of manufacturers, government agencies, and for the World Health Organization in the evaluation of health risk associated with human exposure to chemical substances of all types. Dr. Rogers came to consulting after a 15-year career as a scientist at the US FDA where his last four years he served as Associate Commissioner for Health Affairs. Among other service roles, he has served on 40 boards and committees of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Thank you, Dr. Rodericks, and I turn the virtual podium over to you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm happy to be here and talk about this immensely interesting subject of the possible role of the microbiome. In my case, focusing on uh, what I call chemical risk assessments. Uh, not not the diet as a whole, not other aspects of food uh, ingredient safety, but chemicals, either additives, perhaps contaminants as well might apply. Uh, and I'm going to focus on uh, the question of whether we should be paying much more attention to the microbiome in those assessments, uh, whether we might be missing something serious by way of uh, evaluation of risk if we don't pay enough attention to the microbiome. Um, my takeaway will be, I'll, I'll tell you the two takeaways I have at the moment uh, before I get into the talk, and that is one, we don't know enough yet about those interactions to take them into account in a conventional way for risk assessment, and number two, uh, we better start learning uh, whether or not this is important, the research is necessary. So this is a research focus. Let's go on to the next slide. Next. Are you not hearing me? Yeah. Uh, this is my, uh, my, this is a little statement of uh, how the, the talk was prepared. It's entirely my own. Okay, so most of you know about risk assessment. It's the way we go on. Yes, th this is fine. Um, what's at stake here? Well, risk assessment is the question. Uh, we, uh, it is the process we go through to understand how chemicals may harm health, the likelihood of that happening. Uh, we rely upon epidemiology studies, experimental studies uh, to get to those determinations. And then it is, uh, uh, we look at human intake and exposure to those chemicals and make some determination of safety. That's what we go through in the, in the risk assessment process. Go on to the next slide, please. But keep in mind, there are always uh, uncertainties in risk assessments. Uh, we always have the issue of how we take data from studied human populations and relate it to other unstudied populations. The same thing with the use of animal and other experimental studies? How does the dose risk relationship, which we understand perhaps at one range of doses, how does it uh, apply to other doses that we don't study or cannot study? The fourth bullet here is about variability in risk across species and among humans. This is the perhaps the greatest uncertainty in all of risk assessment. So we, we always have these uncertainties, but over the years we have developed ways to deal with them. We make some assumptions which may not be fully validated scientifically, but they're quite widely accepted. Let me just make the point that uh, those assumptions that are commonly used in these risk assessment processes have not been, or were developed, that is, uh, before we began to understand whether the microbiome might have a role in all of this. So the question of whether uh, these uncertainties and the way we deal with them holds for the future depends very much on how we understand uh, the role of the microbiome and, and its importance. Let's go on. So let's, let's, do, let's look at my what if here. What if current methods, the methods we have for identifying health, health effects, identifying dose risk relationships, and measures of exposure do not reflect the influence of the microbiome, if that is true, uh, in some very explicit way, are, are we then compromising our decisions to protect health? And is that possible? Uh, let's an try to answer that question with the next slide. We don't know the answer to the question. 
We don't know right now whether uh, we are compromising health, compromising safety, because of failures to consider the influence of the microbiome. But I will say there are good reasons to find out. That's why, whether this is the case. Uh, I base a lot of this on a study produced in actually 2018 by the National Academy of Sciences. This is a committee on which I served, Environmental Chemicals, the Human Microbiome and Health Risk, a research strategy. Uh, this report lays out all the reasons why we need the research to answer these questions, which are now unanswerable. Uh, and I recommend that to you. It's not about food chemicals in particular, but chemicals in general. Let's move on. Uh, first of all, uh, we might say a little bit about the way the microbiome can affect the, the uh, toxicity or hazards produced by chemicals. Uh, available evidence uh, suggests at least the following pathways. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Pariza has already mentioned the direct effect on microbiome composition and function. Will those effects, some perturbation in the microbiome composition, changes in function, can they then result in health effects in the host because of those changes? That's a great question. There is some evidence that can happen, but that's a very difficult issue to study. But it is certainly possible that something, uh, something along those lines can affect outcome, and we ought to be looking at it. Alteration of epithelial barrier functions, which is something that the microbiome in the gut can certainly do. Um, uh, can that affect then how chemicals behave in the body in some way, which may increase their toxicity if they were not uh, in, into play? Direct effects on chemical metabolism. Transformation of host-generated metabolism. There's some evidence that uh, there is, for example, uh, liver metabolism aimed at glucuronidation and excretion pathway, a detoxification pathway for many chemicals. But gut microbes are great at reversing that uh, process uh, if, if the chemical then returns to the gut. So could that then affect outcomes? So the, the, the supporting roles of the roles of all these pathways is incomplete. It's insufficient to understand what's really going on here, but there's certainly uh, uh, something to be pursued in the research arena. And I might say that these effects might be, we're interested in adverse effects because we certainly want to avoid those, but these same functions may be, um, these same pathways may uh, have positive effects in one way or another or reduce toxicity. We need to learn more. Let's go on to what I call a couple of, next slide, a couple of what I call thought experiments, um, where we have some information, but uh, not enough to make any definitive statements. But uh, just think about the consequences if these were true. Certain types of, this is, let's talk about human studies, for example. Certain perturbations can norm, alter normal functioning of certain systems of the body. Adverse health effects may follow. Because of variability in the microbiome across human populations, we have two possible uh, consequences here, neither which is all that great. Adverse effects observed in one study population may not occur in others. You know that in human studies, uh, even clinical trials and also observational studies for sure, there are often for the same substance quite quite diverse outcomes in different populations. Is it possible that variability in the microbiome plays a role in those kinds of uh, differences. Let's go on to the next uh, slide, please. Same thing here holds for animal studies. Um, we can certainly see uh, perturbations in various animal studies. It's been well documented. But <clears throat> the microbiomes of animals vary in composition from those of humans. So we have, again, uh, thinking this through, Effects observed in animals because of microbiome perturbations may not occur in humans or the failure to observe adverse effects in animal models from a given exposure does not ensure that we have, we, that we have an, the absence of an effect that is relevant to humans. These experiments are not easy to do and the interpretation if the microbiome is involved is also quite difficult. Let's move on. Uh, so, if either one of these, what I call thought experiments, is correct, uh, the consequences that I talked about, uh, if they are correct, 
let us, we have to conclude that the failure to understand whether and how the microbiome influences the production of toxicity can lead both to false positive and false negative findings from these the, the studies, the kind of studies we rely upon for human hazard evaluation and health risk assessment. We have then the possibility of at least partially mischaracterizing uh, those uh, risks. Let's move on. Uh, uh, Dr. Pariza already talked uh, somewhat about this more detail than I will. Uh, but there has been uh, quite a lot of work on the alteration of microbiome by our own composition uh, from certain classes of metals, arsenic in particular, which is a known food contaminant, of course, uh, is very, very well studied, cadmium as well, uh, several pesticides, antibiotics go back a long way, uh, and certain non-nutritive sweeteners uh, as also have been studied, where there is, here we're talking about alterations in composition, not necessarily function, not necessarily leading to adverse health outcomes. Health, health outcomes. In most cases, uh, a causal link between these alterations and adverse health consequences have really not been established. They're just absent. It's not an easy thing to do, um, but uh, the clear causal link is absent. And I think Dr. Pariza has already talked about non-nutritive sweetnesses Sweeteners, I had the same reaction to the data that he had having to this diverse set of chemical structures producing these kinds of, uh, I guess, uh, metabolic and other changes in, in common seems a little bit unusual. Uh, and, and there are studies, I think Dr. Pariza put one up showing that some studies show that these microbiome perturbations are not likely to occur at ordinary levels of human intake. So suggestive, Questions arise here, but no definitive answers. So there's a lot of research here that could be done. And I might say this research is not so simple, uh, as I understand it, listening to talking with those who are involved in the research. There are a lot of issues uh, that are just very hard to pursue fully in the research. This is not an easy research area at all. Um, let me move on. Uh, the microbiome is not just another organ, so keep that in mind. It changes throughout life from gestation to death. It's, it's specific to gender and race, or it's, it's variation. Its composition, its gene content, its functions change with gender and race. And again, over the lifetime, uh, pregnancy status can affect it. Diet and geography are perhaps the major, if, uh, influences on the microbiome, and there's even variation within the body at different body sites in the composition. So if there is an effect of the microbiome on hazard outcome or risk, uh, it's likely to be far more variable than uh, what we see, uh, we now consider to be the variation in effects. Uh, we might learn from this, but maybe we don't, maybe there's much more variation out there than we know. Uh, something to be pursued. Let's move on. Uh, however, if, if you look at the literature in, in depth here, you'll find that the, what we now know is pretty meager relative to the questions that arise here. Uh, there's little, if you look at the studies of perturbations, for example, of the gut microbiome by various chemicals, there's very little dose response information in those studies. How does the, how do those perturbances change with dose? Uh, how much per perturbation is necessary to lead, if any, to lead to any adverse health effect? Um, how, how do they, how do those per perturbations change with dose? And there's the issue of time here as well. Uh, how, uh, how a change over some short period of time may have an effect, whereas uh, over longer periods of time, it perhaps doesn't. Uh, there are questions of that kind that arise continuously here that are still unanswered. Let's go move on. The measure of dose. Um, another topic here where we have little information for those chemicals that have been studied for their effects on the microbiome. Uh, what is the proper measure of dose? Is it the administered dose? Is it the dose reaching the microbiome? what we might call the target site dose. 
Uh, what about duration of exposure? Uh, there's very little study of any of these questions, which are quite essential for understanding risk and for extrapolating uh, from humans, from animal studies, for example, to humans, or from one human population to another. And I think I have one more slide on what we're missing. Uh, next slide. Uh, I guess I don't. Uh, but uh, one issue that arises, I was going to say on the last slide, one issue that arises quite a lot uh, in uh, using animal studies in particular is how you scale doses from animals to humans uh, when making the risk assessment process. And we don't, again, know enough about uh, whether there's an effect and how that dose that causes the effect, if there is one, might scale from uh, animals to humans. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, it's kind of a bleak picture, you might say, of understanding here. But I think the truth is uh, we're dealing with a very complicated biological system. Um, and we don't have nearly enough understanding of chemical interactions with it to incorporate those interactions into uh, a chemical risk assessment. And I think we haven't done that at all yet. Uh, for chemical agents uh, uh, of the type that we have been discussing here, uh, there's not, there is yet only indirect evidence that those effects are important in the development of chemically related adverse effects. But uh, we have to conclude that there's enough suggestive evidence to support some research. Uh, so some really targeted research here will be very valuable. I might also say that, as I mentioned earlier, that one very important thing we might learn uh, if this is a real phenomenon and a significant phenomenon, that is the interaction with the microbiome and mediation of effects through interactions with the microbiome, um, then um, uh, the we might learn a great deal about variability in uh, uh, response across human populations in particular, and how if they are in fact related to the microbiome. Just studying that uh, phenomenon might be very valuable in the long term. So anyway, I will leave it there and uh, hope to take some questions now. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Roderick. And now we have some time for some questions. We have a number of representatives joining us from the three ELC North America committees. If you have a question, please state your name and affiliation first. I believe Lee Gross has a question. Um, hello. Thank you for these presentations. Um, yes. Uh, so in, in just in reference to some of the sweetener conversations, um, uh, Dr. Pariza noted that uh, some of them aren't metabolized, and I'm just wondering when there isn't uh, metabolism or metabolism is happening uh, in the upper intestine, um, and there aren't any adverse effects found with, you know, the typical kind of toxicology studies that are done with sweeteners, which are at extremely high doses, um, and, and so you wouldn't expect there's some sort of, you know, specific toxicity to gut microbiome uh, species without uh, with those kind of with with an absence of effect at high doses how do we interpret in 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 light of those kinds of facts um, short-term microbiota tests that do show changes like how do you how how does the public deal with that yeah, I think it's not just the public. Um, I think it's also <laughs> the, the you guys yeah. in the industry. You've hit the nail right smack on the head. Uh, if you start doing studies like this, you're going to find effects. You know you're going to. I mean, it's inevitable. And then the question is, what do they mean? So I think that's going to be the issue. Small changes in the microbiome. Uh, that's why I'm saying when you do these studies, you, you really need to follow the same rat through the whole study. Uh, small, you know, by, by, by analyzing feces more than just once at the end of the study, and, and you can use the same rat as its own control because you can do it before and at the end. And then, if necessary, keep on following it afterwards when you stop feeding the ingredient uh, to see what happens later. Um, what you don't want to do is you don't want to have your test protocol turn into a research project. 
uh, that would be very bad if it defeats the whole purpose of what you're trying to do. So um, it, it's, uh, it, it's a tough issue. If you start doing these tests, and I think that there's going to be a lot of pressure to do this, um, you're just going to have to look at the results and, 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 um, and do the best we can. And, and small changes I wouldn't worry too much about. Huge, big changes inevitably you're going to say, well, what does that mean? And maybe you have to go to a pig model or something to find out uh, if, it, in fact, it translates into an animal other than a, other than a rat. Uh, but you have hit the nail on the head, and um, it, we're, we're sort of into new territory, and it's a bit murky right now. Yeah, I have much the same response. We don't know the answer to your question, and uh, we, we don't believe there's any reason to think there's a problem. But there's a possibility that the animal models, the standard animal models we're using are not really relevant to the human microbiome in some ways. And so if there is a microbiome interaction, uh, we're, we're not finding it in those standard animal models. That's one possible uh, issue that should be explored further. I, I don't know whether the pig is the good model in all cases, but it certainly can be. Uh, but, but these are open questions uh, that are still subject to evaluation, but you cannot, I don't think they're answerable with standard animal models or other standard models. Thank you. Thank you for that. I believe Corey Scott has a question as well. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Brees and, and Dr. Rodericks. Um, uh, my question is uh, on the context of a total diet. So I know we talked a lot about ingredients uh, today, but uh, taking this in the context of a total diet, uh, how do the day-to-day -day dietary uh, changes of individuals uh, when you're changing what you eat every day and you're introducing different types of ingredients into your body like fats and carbohydrates and proteins and other ingredients um, how would you say that these different changes on a day-to-day -day basis would affect gut microflora profile and function and do these type of big changes would they really override any effect that we may see on on, on an individual ingredient um well, maybe uh, I should start that one again. The, uh, it seems to me that you, this is another uh, extremely insightful uh, question that you've asked, uh, just like the last one. Uh, the, there's, no, there's no doubt that if you start switching, that, that standard diets, that, that so-called standard diets that we're all eating will have, can, can have very pronounced and profound effects on the, on the GI tract. We already know that. On the microbial flora, um, I showed a slide at the beginning that if you if you're eating a, a meat diet, uh, say, say you're eating a standard diet with a lot of fiber in it, and you go on vacation and uh, you can't find your favorite breakfast cereal, and you start eating a lot of uh, seafood and and uh, meat instead, you're going to see a big change in your in your GI tract. We do not know what that means. Uh, it may mean nothing more than a few, uh, maybe a day or two of indigestion. Uh, it's most likely what's going to happen, uh, and and as you switch diets, this is this uh, uh, and and the kind of kind of food you're eating, this undoubtedly has day-to-day -day effects. Um, now, I guess that I guess what you're saying is how do you, yeah how do you evaluate that with regard to a much smaller change that you might see from a food ingredient, and that is an extremely important question. That's why I think we have to be really careful about this whole area. Uh, just finding an effect on, on, a, on, on the gut microbiome is not enough. You have to be able to tie it into something that is significant in terms of toxicology in order to make any kind of assessment. Otherwise, there's, uh, you're just going to end up raising a lot more questions that can't be answered and, and, uh, and creating a lot more issues that we don't really, uh, can't, that really can't be addressed. Um, I like you know so so I think this is why in every case you're going to have to have careful evaluation as long as you're talking about small changes or or uh, I don't think there's going to be much of an issue if you get into big changes from a dietary ingredient uh, I think you need to ask why why are you getting that big change um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's that it, that you're into a, into an adverse situation yeah. Yeah, and just I add one more point because I think Dr. Rise is correct about all of that. But 
the one other issue I would add is that we can, if we think about extrapolating studies from animals, for example, to humans or one human population to another, the issue of the enormous variation due to diet changes uh, becomes almost imponderable to me. I'm not sure how that ever is going to be taken into account in an adequate way. It might be wrong, or maybe more research we can find that out. But that seems to be a major stumbling block uh, to using data and extrapolating to human populations in any of this. Okay, th thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Corey, for your question. I believe we also have a question from Yen Wu. Yen had to leave, actually. Oh, okay. Well, um, then we'll move on to a question from Chris. Uh, yes, you know, again, I echo what the, the others said. They were excellent presentations. Thank you so much. Um, and my question relates a little bit to um, how changes in the microbiome can you know, predict a specific outcome. You, know, you see a lot of studies that show changes in the gut microbiome profile. And are any of these changes been shown to be reliably able to predict things like risk for you know, obesity or weight gain or changes in blood glucose? Or are we too far from that? Nothing that I know well, of. It, <laughs> go ahead, Mike. Maybe, yeah. Well, that's, okay. I don't. I don't know of any, Joe. I don't know if you do or not. Well, the word, the emphasis is on the word reliable. <laughs> so I guess uh, there are certainly studies. There, there are a lot of studies where there's a, an induced change in the microbiome, and then the microbiome is transplanted into a germ-free animal, and you can re, and you can reproduce the same outcome the same uh, uh, the same outcome in the animal that that where, where you introduced the uh, changed microbiome the the so-called uh, affected microbiome uh, but th those are very problematic studies they're hard to interpret in many cases the chemical that induced the change in the first species is carried into the second species in the microbiome itself so there, there are a lot of a lot of problems with these kinds of studies, but that's the kind of evidence I think that has been developed. Uh, mostly, these transplant studies are suggesting that what you find in one animal is verified by transplanting the altered microbiome into a germ-free animal. But beyond that, I don't think there's very much evidence, and those, as I said, are quite problematic. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to open the floor up for anyone else that has any additional questions. Okay, it looks like we don't have any other questions. I'd like to thank the speakers again and IFT, um, and our session has drawn to a close. Thank you, everyone.